welcome to Oracle's first quarter 2021 earnings conference call. Now I'd like to turn today's call over to Ken Bond, Senior Vice President. Thank you, Erica. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Oracle's first quarter fiscal year 2021 earnings conference call. A copy of the press release and financial tables, which includes a gap to non-gap reconciliation and other supplemental financial information can be viewed and downloaded from our investor relations website. Additionally, a list of customers being mentioned on this conference call, which have purchased Oracle Cloud services or went live on Oracle Cloud this quarter, will also be available from our investor relations website. On the call today are Chairman and Chief Technology Officer Larry Ellison and CEO Safra Katz. As a reminder, today's discussion will include forward-looking statements, including predictions, expectations, estimates, or other information that might be considered forward-looking. Throughout today's discussion, we will present some important factors relating to our business, which may potentially affect these forward-looking statements. These forward-looking statements are also subject to risks and uncertainties that may cause actual results to differ materially from statements being made today. As a result, we caution you from placing undue reliance on these forward-looking statements, and we encourage you to review our most recent reports, including our 10-K and 10-Q, and any applicable amendments for a complete discussion of these factors and other risks that may affect our future results or the market price of our stock. And finally, we are not obligating ourselves to revise our results or publicly release any revisions to these forward-looking statements in light of new information or future events. Before taking questions, we'll begin with a few prepared remarks, and with that, I'd like to turn the call over to Safra. Thanks, Ken, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Before I start, I want to make sure you understand that we will be making no comments regarding the press reports about TikTok, so there's no need to ask. Uh, so now to Oracle's results. As you can see, we had a great quarter. As usual, I'll review our non-GAAP results using constant dollar growth rate, unless I say otherwise. This quarter, revenue was more than $150 million above the midpoint of guidance, and EPS was $0.07 cents above the midpoint. Currency helps a little, but this quarter was all about solid execution on the sales side and disciplined management of our operations. As operating income grew 8%, our best result in three years. As I've said previously, and only briefly interrupted by COVID-19, our mix of business is increasingly favorable. What that means is that our growing businesses are growing faster and are now larger than our declining businesses. Our fusion SaaS momentum is very strong. We're seeing the success of autonomous database, which will continue to get even better now that we have autonomous database available on clouded customer. Our total cloud services and license support revenues for the quarter were 6.9 billion, up 2% from last year, and accounted for 74% of total company revenue. Gap application subscription revenues were 2.8 billion, up 4%, but our fusion apps were up 26%, with Fusion ERP up 33%, and NetSuite ERP up 23%. Fusion HCM was up 22%. And our Fusion retention rates, which are already high, continue to go up. Gap infrastructure subscription revenues were $4.1 billion, up 1% but with database revenue up 3%. Autonomous database consumption revenue was up 64%. And annualized consumption revenue for OCI was up 130%. Licensed revenues were $886 million, up 8%. So all in, total revenues for the quarter were $9.4 billion, up 2%. As usual, we have continued to be disciplined in our spending with operating expenses actually down 3% this quarter. Non-GAAP operating income was $4.2 billion, as I said, up 8% from last year, and our best operating income growth in three years. Obviously, we're thrilled with this result, and I expect the Q2 
will be good as we're beginning to see our operating income become a bigger part of our EPS growth. Operating margin was 45%, up nearly 300 basis points from 42% last year. The non-GAAP tax rate for the quarter was 19.1, slightly below our base tax rate of 20% as a result of some discrete items and EPS was 93 cents in U.S. dollars, up 15% in U.S. dollars, 14% in constant currency, and that is despite an interest expense being $120 million higher year over year for the quarter. The gap tax rate was 13.3%, also a result of some discrete items, and gap EPS was $0.72 cents in U.S. dollars, up 16%, and up 15% in constant currency. Operating cash flow over the last four quarters was $13.1 billion, with capital expenditures of $1.6 billion, and free cash flow of $11.5 billion over that same period. We now have more than $42 billion in cash and marketable securities. The short-term deferred revenue balance is $9.9 billion, down 4% in constant currency from a year ago due entirely to timing differences in customer payments. Gross deferred revenue was, in fact, up in constant currency, and it was up 2%. As we've said before, we're committed to returning value to our shareholders through technical innovation, strategic acquisitions, stock repurchases, prudent use of debt, and a dividend. This quarter, we repurchased nearly 90 million shares for a total of $5 billion. Over the last 12 months, we've repurchased 361 million shares for a total of $19.2 billion. Over the last 10 years, we have reduced the shares outstanding by 40%. In addition, we've paid out dividends of $3 billion over the last 12 months, and the board of directors again declared a quarterly dividend of 24 cents. Now to the guidance. Again, my guidance today is on a non-GAAP basis and in constant currency. Now, currency, though, is extremely volatile, as you can see in what happened in this quarter. And But assuming current exchange rates remain the same as they are now, currency should have a slightly less than 1% positive impact on total revenue and potentially two cent positive income effect on EPS for Q2. So with that, total revenues are expected to grow between 1% to 3% in US dollars. And um, with, because we will have slightly under a 1% tailwind. So in constant currency, that kind of rounds into zero to 2%, but probably at the higher side. Non-GAAP EPS in constant currency is expected to grow 8 to 12% between 96 cents and a dollar in constant currency. But again, that's assuming a two-cent tailwind. So non-GAAP EPS in USD is expected to grow 10 to 14% and to be between 98 cents and a dollar two in U.S. dollars. Now, my EPS guidance for Q2 assumes our base tax rate of 20%. However, as you see, it's usually a little below it. Sometimes it's a little above it. However, one-time tax events could cause the actual tax rate for any given quarter to vary. But I expect in normalizing for these things, it'll average to 20%. So that's what I've targeted in this guidance. And with that, I'll turn it over to Larry for his comments. Thanks, Deborah. Uh, let's see. Oracle occupies a unique position in the cloud market. Oracle is the only cloud vendor that competes in both the enterprise applications market, SaaS, and the infrastructure as a service market, IaaS. Our competitors in SaaS are people like Salesforce and Workday. Our competitors in IaaS are people like Microsoft and Amazon. There are different markets. We're the only one that spans these two markets. It's a very interesting dynamic. 
I believe we have the best technology in the market today at both the applications layer and the infrastructure layer of the cloud. While analysts have ranked Oracle Cloud applications number one in both market share and customer satisfaction for some time, we're number one in customer satisfaction in HCM, we're number one in customer satisfaction in, uh, uh, in ERP, I can go, I can go on. Uh, but what's interesting is that, is that those same analysts are beginning to take notice of the technical quality and customer satisfaction associated with Oracle's cloud infrastructure as a service business. I'd like to read an approved statement from IDC about their recently published survey. In the 2020 Industry Cloud Path survey that IDC recently released, where it surveyed 935 IaaS customers on their satisfaction with top IaaS vendors, including Oracle, Amazon Web Services, Microsoft, IBM, and Google. Oracle IaaS, OCI, received the highest satisfaction score and the biggest year-over-year -year score increase of all IaaS vendors. In addition, 86% of those surveys said they expect their spend on Oracle IaaS and OCI to increase in the future. I suspect this comes as a big surprise to many of you and many of our competitors. Just as Zoom picking Oracle infrastructure surprised a lot of people in the recent past. I know the biggest question for investors has been, can Oracle preserve its huge market-leading database franchise into this new cloud era? Well, interesting question. Obviously an extremely important question to me and, other, and, and everyone here at Oracle. But... If Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, OCI, is in fact, as, OCI, as IDC describes it, the best IaaS pl platform in the market, the IaaS platform with the highest customer satisfaction, and that same IaaS, OCI, is the foundation for the world's only autonomous database, where do you think? the Oracle database installed base is going to go. What we're beginning to see is that it's just starting to migrate. And it's migrating to both the Oracle public cloud, the only place you can get the autonomous database, and Oracle cloud a customer, excuse me, the only other place you can get the Oracle autonomous database and Oracle cloud infrastructure all together. Customers are picking Oracle Cloud Infrastructure and the Oracle Autonomous Database for a few very basic and very obvious reasons. Much better security, much better reliability, much better performance, and dramatically lower cost, much, much lower cost than AWS. And that's why people are, and I'll talk about the, you know, people like 8x8, uh, are another, another uh, video conferencing system, are moving entirely from AWS onto the Oracle Cloud. Uh, in fact, there's not a major video conferencing company uh, that isn't talking to Oracle about moving to the Oracle Cloud. Zoom is a perfect example of why customers are choosing Oracle Cloud infrastructure. We see the benefits of, of choosing OCI and Zoom's results. Zoom's recent earnings were stunning. Zoom may be the fastest company ever to have their company name become a verb. At Oracle, we love to Zoom, as most of our employees continue to work from home. And we love that Zoom's usage of Oracle Cloud Infrastructure Services delivered triple-digit revenue growth in sequential quarters from Q4 last year to Q1 this year. OCI cloud data centers are opening all over the world at a record pace. 
we now have 26 OCI regions live around the world, edging out Amazon AWS, which currently has 24 regions. And we'll be adding at least another 10 regions in the next nine months. We're not slowing down. We're speeding up. Oracle Database Cloud and Customer is functionally identical to the Oracle database in the public cloud. That's why we're seeing the migrations going both places. Uh, they're going to Database Cloud and Customer, which is a unique Oracle offering, and they're going directly into our public cloud. So the price is the same in both cases. The database is fully serverless and elastic in both cases. You only pay for what you use in both cases, and there are no upfront fees in both cases. We are seeing very rapid adoption of Oracle database cloud and customer among our very largest customers. And this is just the beginning. In 2018, we delivered the world's first autonomous database. And the Oracle Autonomous, uh, and the Oracle Autonomous Database is still the world's only autonomous database. Then in 2019, we introduced the world's first autonomous operating system. And today, Oracle Autonomous Linux is still the world's only autonomous operating system. Now in 2020, we've introduced Oracle Autonomous Data Guard, which effectively eliminates site downtime. If the data center running your application goes down for any reason, Autonomous Data Guard immediately switches and automatically, immediately and automatically switches that application over to another data center. No human intervention is required to keep your application running without interruption. And no human labor is required to set up and configure a con Autonomous Data Guard. To use Autonomous Data Guard, there's nothing to learn and nothing to do. You just have to turn on a single switch. Only Oracle offers this autonomous reliability feature. Another unique OCI offering is our dedicated region Gen2 Cloud customer. Customers can now put our entire Gen2 public cloud behind their firewall in their data center, all of it. It's not just the Oracle database behind your firewall. It's every service that's in our public cloud, compute, storage, fusion application, plus the autonomous database, autonomous Linux, autonomous data guard, everything. And we manage it and maintain it for the customer. You get all the benefits of the cloud, but it's in your data center behind your firewall. No one not Amazon, not Microsoft, not Google. Nobody but Oracle can give customers a complete public cloud in their data center behind their firewall. Our strategic services are growing rapidly. Autonomous revenue grew, uh, autonomous database revenue grew, grew 64% uh, in annualized consumption. Our Gen 2 OCI consumption rate uh, was 130%. We're clearly growing faster than the market, and we're taking market share in the process. With that, I'll turn it back over to Ken. Thank you, Larry. Uh, Erica, if you could please queue up the audience for questions. We'll go to Q&A now. Ladies and gentlemen, to ask a question, press star 1 on your telephone keypad. To withdraw your question, press the pound key. Our first question comes from Mark Merdler with Bernstein Research. Thank you, and congratulations on the strong quarter, and especially on license and margins. Um, I'd like to ask about the guidance. While Q1 was strong, the economic disruption of COVID-19 is, is not yet over, and yet you're guiding what looks strongly. Can you give us some more color on why you feel so confident, and specifically, are you modeling in, can increased strength in database, SAS ERP HCM, how big a factor is Gen2 Cloud in the guidance? Any information would be appreciated, thanks. Sure, um, thanks for the question. So it's really following the path that we were on before COVID really hit in March. And so we were. what is going on is very basically an extrapolation of what's happening in the business. So 
the things that are going very well and are growing and are getting larger and larger is everything associated with the cloud. And that, though, does have implications on license because options grew not only, database options grew not only double digits, but actually 20 something percent. And analytics also grew because as you know, with, your, with Oracle licenses, you can bring them to our cloud. But in addition, Exadata um, and some of our uh, Oracle specific hardware that's very strategic still continues to do well. But really the big barn beaters are the fact that our SaaS business is large and growing quickly. And now OCI and our database cloud products and services are growing and they're getting larger and larger. And so because we've got annual consumption revenue growing over 100% and this kind of, this is now overwhelms the fact that some of our businesses, I'll give you an example, on-premise consulting, this business continues to get smaller. And so it's completely overwhelmed by the businesses that are growing faster. And commitment to our database is incredibly strong. More and more of our customers want to bring their Oracle databases to the Oracle Cloud. And then of course you have the cases that Larry talked about where our just Oracle Cloud infrastructure Gen 2 is just so good and so much cheaper and so performant and secure that more and more applications want to come to that. So that's really what's going on. I'm not seeing into the future. I'm basically looking at what's going on under the covers and it's a very easy extrapolation as our installed bases of our cloud businesses continue to grow. Excellent, thank you. Next question, our, please. Our thank next you, question comes from Brad Zelnick with Credit Suisse. Great, thanks so much for taking the question and I'll echo my congrats uh, to, to the company as well. I, I wanna ask about clouded customer, clearly, there's a lot of excitement for how it can enable very large customers to adopt autonomous database and, and have all the benefits of OCI behind the firewall. And I appreciate it's only really become available in the last few months, but maybe for Larry, from a product market fit perspective, can you explain why this is such a big deal? And, and for Safra, are there any leading indicators you can point to, maybe backlog or anything else to help us understand the, the leading demand for these products and which I assume it supports your confidence in the overall business accelerating. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think I can explain it uh, very, very clearly. So uh, we've been working on Oracle Autonomous Database for several years, as I mentioned uh, in my preamble. Uh, we came up with Oracle Autonomous Database in 2018. But, there, if you, but if you're an on-premise user, there was no way to get access to the Oracle Autonomous Database until a couple of months ago. Uh, so the Oracle Autonomous Database was available in our public cloud and has been for three years, and it keeps getting better and better. But if you're an on, a big on-premise customer, uh, you know you didn't have the late access to our latest and greatest database. It was a very strange situation for Oracle that our late technology was not available to the vast majority of our customers. All of a sudden, with a clouded customer, with a database clouded customer at very low prices. Uh, uh, our, you can get Oracle Autonomous Database and all the latest and greatest features we offer in, in the database uh, and have it delivered uh, to your data center behind your firewall. And we think uh, the growth here is going to be explosive. We had a version one, actually, I'll just, you know, full disclosure, we had a version one of this that was rather difficult to install and difficult to use. And version two is kind of the extreme opposite. We learned a lot. Uh, and version two is, you know, really a plug and play. It uh, goes in very, very fast, uh, and it's very simple to use, incredibly reliable, and we're and we expect this to be one of one of the great stories this this fiscal year. We think this is going to be triple digit growth, uh, or uh, you know, Oracle database cloud customer. And it's, the other thing is, it's just going to preserve our our database franchise. 
There's two ways. The, uh, people are going to make the choice to upgrade or you know, and, and move from their current version of Oracle to autonomous database. And once at autonomous database, they're not going anywhere. Great. Thank you. Next question, please. Our next question is from Heather Bellini with Goldman Sachs. Thank you so much um, to the two of you. I just let Safra, so OCI had a great quarter, and, and obviously you've had really impressive growth with customers like Zoom that you highlighted. Can, can you talk to us a little bit about the pipeline momentum you're seeing with OCI as customers accelerate their migrations to the cloud? And also, can you share with us what type of workloads and applications are seeing the most traction with it, or is it really broad-based? Thank you. Okay, let me start, but I know Larry's going to want to say a few things about this. So first of all, you have to understand that our new Fusion customers are also on OCI, which means that all of the applications that they want to build themselves, all custom things, they're on the Oracle database, they're going to be putting them on OCI also. In addition, you have to realize that many of our database customers stayed on premise and waited for us to have OCI Gen 2, which is powerful enough, secure enough, and scalable enough for their crown jewels. And they've literally waited. And I know, and I have visibility into sort of the future, because often they want to do what we call BYOL, bring your own license, but they often need options. And so I can see their intentions when they're buying those options to bring those database workloads. Now, it is falling into the same categories that you've seen historically with us. The communications industry, the financial services industry, all of the industries that have very important high performance applications that run on Oracle, they've been waiting to put them at OCI, and so we see that. Now, some of them are putting it in the public cloud, many of them, actually many more than I would have expected, and then others are doing cloud at customer, and this second generation of cloud at customer, now with autonomous database, is, is just so powerful for our customers. So we're talking about app customers, database customers, custom applications, and then there are applications that otherwise just run at some of the competing cloud services that when they do, just like Zoom did, but 8 by 8 a whole bunch of others that really use a lot of network, a lot of compute, may use a lot of storage, may have a lot of egress, you know, back and forth taking data in and out, they realize that Oracle is both more performant, and since you pay by the minute, the day, the hour, it's much, much cheaper. So we compete at every level of the stack, and it's really very, very, very broad base for us. I don't know, Larry, if you want to talk about, add some more to that. Yeah, I'll add a little bit of color. When Safra says our customers waited for us, let me add a little more information. Uh, a lot of those customers actually tried to run Oracle at AWS. They tried. It just didn't work very well. So uh, so they decided maybe they should wait. Uh, and so they did. Uh, so they did try. They, they looked around. Uh, they experimented, but the vast, vast, vast majority didn't work very well. Uh, we have an Exadata cloud service. We have, a, you know, autonomous database is not available any place but the Oracle cloud. Exadata database service isn't available any place but the Oracle cloud. Uh, we're, we're much better at running. You'd expect us to be much better at running Oracle applications than anybody else, and we are. And a significant percentage of enterprise applications, you know, I don't know, 40%, 30%, 40% are Oracle applications. Uh, so that's, a, that's a, just a gigantic installed base. Uh, that we think is going to be moving to the Oracle. We, we're, starting to, we're starting to watch it move to the Oracle Cloud. So that's one thing. So they tried, didn't work. Uh, so they're coming to us. Uh, uh, next, next thing, uh, a lot of our application customers, you know, we've got 
well over 7,000 uh, customer Fusion application customers, 7,000 Fusion ERP customers. Now those customers uh, are beginning to build data warehouses around their ERP data. Everyone does. And they're building those data warehouses using autonomous database and Oracle Analytics in the, or in, in the Oracle uh, Cloud using Oracle Infrastructure Services. As I say, the Oracle Analytic Cloud is an Oracle Infrastructure Service, an OCI service, the autonomous database, an OCI service. So our application customers, pretty much all of our medium and large application customers will become in the not too distant future will become infrastructure customers. Uh, a lot again, and you've got to add them on too. So these are these are people that are SaaS customers are going to become infrastructure customers. On premise database customers are going to become infrastructure customers, either in the form of clouded customer or public cloud. Uh, then there are the then there are the surprises like Zoom, uh, you know, an eight by eight and but there are more surprises like that. Well, I, I, think, I think Zoom is a great example because it proves that the Oracle Cloud is secure, reliable, high performance, and economical. Uh, they pick it because it has nothing to do with the Oracle database. It has nothing to do with them doing a SaaS customer. That was just purely an evaluation of our cloud versus Microsoft's versus Google's versus Amazon's. And uh, another example of that is high performance computing. Car companies, car companies simulating crashes. Now, why would anyone go to the Oracle Cloud to do high-performance computing when you can go to Google, or you can go to Microsoft, or you can go to AWS? Well, because we're much faster, therefore much, uh, it, we're much much faster, and therefore they get their simulations done faster. But they got to be willing to pay less. You know, almost every car company. Well, maybe that's too strong. Half the car companies around the world are now either using uh, our high-performance computing or evaluating our high-performance high computing uh, because we, you know, we we benchmark so well against the competition. And this is all all new business, like the video conferencing business. So the OCI team did a spectacular job of building, you know, a second generation, learning from. What Microsoft did, what 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 Google did, what uh, Amazon did, and then building the next generation, and uh, it, it's so good we're winning business everywhere. So uh, and again, and these are very early days. Gen two de Gen two OCI is relatively new, uh, and uh, and Gen two cloud customer is even newer, uh, and these are both fabulous products that I think are going to do extremely well over uh, the next few years. Thank you. Thank next you very question, much. Please. Our next question comes from Rymo Linchow with Barclays. Hey, congrats from me as well. Um, originally, I wanted to ask about the enterprise edition of TikTok, but you said I shouldn't ask about TikTok, so a different question now. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, could you maybe discuss, like we talked about the strength in cloud, but the other thing that stood out this quarter was how much better you did uh, compared to your peers on the license side. Uh, you know, you were up uh, where everyone kind of were, was down quite significantly. And you touched on some of the drivers, but maybe you could double click on, on some of that again, because that stands really out as something that we haven't seen in the industry. Thank you. Can I, can I, I'd like to comment on that because I, I think our license business is really misunderstood. People think our, they, they see license business and they translate in their brain, license means on-premise. That is not true for us. It may be true for everybody else, by the way. Probably is true for everybody else, but it's not true for us. We have this thing called bring your own license to the cloud. We, we encourage our customers to buy licenses, uh, buy more licenses. And our pitch is you, you can run those licenses in your data center on premise, or you can bring those licenses to the cloud and get big discounts running database in the cloud. So you, you cannot look at our growth and our database license business and say that's the old, a revival of the old on premise business. That is not correct. A lot of these people, we have 
you know, when we see Cellpoolas and EULAs and, and you know, these big, these big uh, contracts for database, the reason people are buying more licenses, a lot of them, not all of them, but a, lot, a majority of them, is because they have the flexibility of bringing those licenses to our public cloud, to clouded customer, and getting big discounts, getting, you know, getting, getting a benefit, getting better prices by doing that. And a lot of people are doing this. So, again, don't translate license to mean not cloud. A lot of the license is in fact cloud, as right. well as on prem In fact, it's driven by their plan to move to the cloud. And that right. is very, very clear because they're buying the specific options, which, as I said, the options number uh, very high, uh, percentage growth this quarter because it's really in preparation for their move to the cloud. But I will also tell you that the, that is available also in analytics and in some of the other um, some of the other uh, tech, you know technology licenses. So analytics very strong, the database options extremely strong very much pointing in the direction of moving to the cloud. So that's really what is driving it. It's not, it's generally not going to be staying on premise. Some of course stays on premise and some will stay on premise indefinitely, but many companies will be either hybrid or will be clouded customer or of course in the public cloud. And that's really what's going on here. And it's, it's really quite clear. Perfect. Thank you. Very clear. Congrats again. Yep. Thank you. Our next question comes from Derek Wood with Cowan and Company. Great. Thanks for taking my question and congrats on a, a strong quarter. I, I wanted to ask about the hardware side of the business. This is the, the first quarter we've seen without negative growth in a long time. And, and to see you hitting 70% gross margin, pretty impressive and, and far sooner than what we would have thought. So does this tell us that you're – you're mostly through bleeding off the commodity pieces and that the majority of growth is driven by Exadata and, and cloud as customer. And how should we generally think about the directional trends from here in both, both in terms of growth and margins? Yes, so the, the hardware growth is entirely dominated by our strategic hardware product, which is really most focused around Exadata. Revenue in Exadata was up 15%. Bookings in our strategic um, in our strategic hardware also up uh, very very high double digits, and we have actually an enormous exadata backlog. Really, the largest uh, it's actually double what it was, um, more than double what it was last year. And the reality is that this segment is a very very strong. We it has now gotten large enough. And, you know, the, the issue for us in Q4, as I mentioned, was really around supply chain. And, you know, that's taking a while to resolve itself, but we are, we're able to make and ship uh, a lot of Exadata, but we have uh, an enormous backlog still behind that. And so that's really what's dominating. And, of course, what that points to is a commitment by our customers to Oracle. You know, you don't buy an Exadata to run anything but Oracle database application, you know, database system. And um, that commitment to the Oracle platform is really uh, shown up in, in this area. Clouded customer is not recognized up front. Um, clouded customer is not recognized in the hardware line at all. In fact, it is recognized um, in the cloud line when they go online and they consume uh, and they consume uh, credits, so uh, cloud credits. So um, it doesn't show up in that, in that on-premise hardware line at all. Our final question comes from Phil Winslow with Wells Fargo. Hi, uh, thanks for taking my question, and congrats on a great start to the fiscal year. 
I uh, just wanted to focus on applications. We haven't really talked about that a lot uh, on, on this call. Uh, you know, obviously, you gave out some really strong numbers with Fusion Cloud. You know, with Safra, you talked about some of the puts and takes in the overall business, and I uh, wonder if you could talk about those sort of applications sure. Uh, specifically. Sure. I mean, really, when you think of our application business, you really have to think about Fusion, and especially Fusion ERP, HBM, our back office, you have to think about NetSuite. Those are the, uh, the fastest growing segments. And you have to take into account that we have some other things in that business that are smaller, and some of them are from acquisitions. And that is the less, um, you know, the, the, the less uh, strategic part of our business. And as that gets smaller, sometimes replaced by fusion, um, that that's why uh, that business is start, is really doing very very well because the ERP uh, everything fusion but fusion ERP HCM this whole area really uh, growing quickly. I mean, what you see is many of our customers, both eBusiness Suite, PeopleSoft, JD Edwards customers, but we also see a new phenomena which is historically it would be hard to push a door of an SAP customer, an SAP on-premise customer, to, but now we find that many of those doors are not only uh, can be uh, basically are already open for us. So as the only provider of ERP in the cloud uh, for large, medium-large companies, the fusion products are really taking off. And so we've been replacing not only our own products and other companies, but we've made a significant uh, foothold in SAP customers simply because they're really very frustrated with their with the vendors that they have installed on premise. So this business for us is an enormous opportunity and it's really just chugging on all cylinders worldwide, in fact. Great. Thanks a lot. Keep up the good work. Okay. Thank you, Safra. Thank you, Phil. A telephonic replay of this conference call will be available for 24 hours. Dial-in information can be found in the press release issued earlier today. Please call the Investor Relations Department with any follow-up questions from this call, and we look forward to speaking with you. Thank you for joining us today, and with that, I'll turn the call back to Erica for closing. Thank you for joining today's Oracle's first quarter 2021 earnings conference call. We appreciate your participation. You may now disconnect.